Hello, and welcome to another episode of A Ghost in the Magazine. I'm Steph. And I'm Jay, the dynamic duo back to air again. <laughs> <laughs> and we're having some technical difficulties. So this episode is probably going to sound different than the rest of our episodes, but at least it's, you'll have it. At least it exists. Yeah. You know? It might, it might not be the best, but it's getting done. And that's the main thing. Period, Pooh. So anyways, it's the second week of uh, the best month out of the year besides October, and that's August, because it's my birthday month. And what film are we talking about this week, Steph? Covering a classic, okay? And uh, last episode, we covered Scream. And I think, I always say, my two favorite movies is a two-way tie between Scream and Child's Play, but I, after <laughs> re-watching it last night, I think this might be my favorite scary movie i think it's slightly above scream because i literally don't have to be in the room and i know what's happening i can i can recite so many lines from this fucking movie and i it's like an emotional support movie which is what does that say about me it is it is really good it's one of them classics uh i do have few issues with this that i will bring up later on nothing bad (laughs) Nothing bad. It's just it's like this could this could have been better. Sure, but for the time it came out, like and it's Don't still okay. Start, that might not be relevant. No, whatever no. you're gonna say. No, only only because Parker has done this with me recently has pointed out that I say okay, but it was the eighties, or okay, but it was the sixties. I think I just feel like it's valid because there were movies that came out after. It's it's perfectly valid until Parker pointed out to me that they were like, okay, so like, oh, it was only Germany in the 40s. You had to be there. No, like, that's not fair. No, that's, not, that's not what we're doing. That's not what we mean when we said that. We're talking about the technical oh. limitations. We're not talking about the Nazis. I don't think Parker would say that to me, though, in not this case. Not to you, no. But then again, Parker <laughs> fancies you. He doesn't fancy me. Well, I mean, oh, sorry, I was going to roast you. Yeah, we're not talking about that right now. We are talking about the fact that I have had so many insults about being ginger throughout my life. And then fucking Chucky comes on the scene, and suddenly... Listen, I <laughs> I think your ginger hair is cool. No, it's not as bad as Chucky's. You, you have to give me that. Like, my hairline right. is much better than Chucky's is. Much better. Uh, in all stages of his his chuckiness, because Chucky does change throughout the years. He changes quite a bit, but he always, you know, he's able to stay uniquely Chucky until we get to the, like, reboot, but we don't have to talk about that. We covered it very briefly. Oh no. my god, I've just realized. Chucky's a redhead, and Bride of Chucky is blonde, and small, and angry. It's me and Parker. <laughs> yeah, but have you murdered anybody lately? I don't the fact recall. That there was a pause. Okay, well, that's something that you can think about while uh, I start talking about the movie. And hopefully the answer is no, um, because that's illegal even in Ireland. So, Charles Lee Ray. That's Chucky's government name, if you didn't know. He's also uh, known as the Lakeshore Strangler, which I think is interesting because, well, and I can't only... say he doesn't really strangle bitches, but he, he did. He did one person in this film. And he feels sure, but it. he has much smaller hands and body. But he's single, a grown ass man. Bit. Like, I mean, if he can drive a knife, if he can use a plastic hammer to hit someone in the head and push them out a window in the same swing, mm-hmm. yeah, we're gonna talk about we're gonna talk about logistics here because that is that is something that uh, I have an issue with. Um, but so. Charles Lee Ray is being chased at the beginning of this movie by um, hot detective Norris, who's Chris Sarandon, and I love everything he's in ever. I don't care what anybody says. Don't. Okay, at me, but Jay. I kept, every, every time I saw him, I was like, this is the creepy fucking psychiatrist that kept Lecter locked up. Like, it, this is the same hairstyle, no, same clothes. Don't say that to me. It's not right, because he's Jerry Dandridge from Fright Night only. And also um, Jack Skellington. Only. Okay? Only. Okay. Only. Not 
Oh, uh, Dr. Chilton. No, that's disrespectful. I if it wasn't just me and you on this episode, I would I would send you to the corner because that's so rude. Um, but but it's only us, and we do fight whenever we're left to our own devices. I'm not thinking about this. I'm right. <laughs> I'm waiting for our CH meetup where we can get one of those like XXL T-shirts that says our get along shirt, and then just force it down. <laughs> oh my gosh! If one existed. L would make us wear it. She would. Hands down. You know who else can't get along all the time? Charles Lee Ray and Detective Mike Norris. Okay. So there's like a shootout. Norris is like, I'm going to get you. And Eddie Caputo is the getaway driver and he abandons Charles Lee Ray. And so obviously that pisses him off. So, you know, they're on the corner of Wabash and Van Buren. And there's a toy store, and so Chucky breaks in there. <laughs> okay, <laughs> this movie gets so ridiculous. It's not. It's hilarious. So he breaks in there, you know, and then he remembers. Oh fuck! I know voodoo as shit. Um. So but like, first he gets he shot. To, first, he has to give the cop a monologue where he's like, "I'm gonna get you and your little dog too," and then yeah, he's like, I'm I'm dying. He literally asks, no matter what. Like, we heard you, bitch. We get it. Revenge. 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 We get it. So, oh, it gets very dramatic. He's dying. There are dolls everywhere. Norris is trying to find him. So he pulls out a good guy doll, which is creepy as fuck. I don't know why kids would ever want those. And then um, he starts summoning the mighty Dembala. And he, Dembala is... um manifests in the form of storm clouds and lightning uh and he does the chant this is what i want to talk about correct me if i'm wrong does he speak french at some point yes some of it is french yeah some of it is french so it's like new orleans voodoo voodoo but lazy writing it's so lazy okay so i looked up the chant because i think it's really fucking funny and i know that throughout the movies he it's slightly different what he says um and so like it's a little different when he's trying to put his soul in a a human body and whatever um and then in bride of chucky when they have the amulet of dembala it's a little bit different and the reason why i looked it up is because i heard some things i definitely heard french i also heard him say santeria and that's not voodoo they're both close practices and they're different so it's it's basically like speak gobbledygook but in an accent but in a language people recognize and think is a little bit mystic yes and it's gross because like obviously i love the movie i love the franchise but like their actual practices that people hold sacred and dembala is is a deity that represents death from what i understand but it's not an inherently malicious just like you say oh white magic black magic whatever like whatever your intent is obviously his intent is to be disgusting and do crimes so he puts himself into this doll and then shit hits the fucking fan because he's in a jaw it's a last ditch attempt in his in his mind because he doesn't know if this is gonna work or not this comes up later in the film as well yeah he's like "Eh, might as well i'm fucking dying i might as well just try it which I have issues with later in the film, but we can talk about this. In a wee while. Don't worry, we'll get there quickly. Because the plot, the plot is very simple. Okay, Karen is a single mom with the cutest little boy in the freaking world, Andy Barclay. Ten times better than Donnie Ter- Torrance, who was the last child we had on the podcast. It was also the last episode me and you recorded together. Um, and also like. Karen, single mom, works mm-hmm. at a at a counter Ooh. in uh yeah works in at a, a counter or a jewelry counter in a department store. Yes. Did you see her apartment? Like I know it's Chicago yes, in the eighties. I did. Like, yeah, there's no fucking way. Well. Sisters doing there's well for no way. She, there's no way. It, it must be a commission thing. She's very sweet. She probably sells like high price fragrances. <laughs> And gets good commission. She's probably a people person. I love her 
so much in this movie. Kim Hicks is perfect. I think she's Seventh Heaven mom. Is that what she's from? Seventh it's this, Heaven. That's- yeah, it's a show. I'm pretty sure she plays the mom in that. But look, I don't know her from anything else the, except for this only, movie. The only good Karen apart from Karen Gillian from Doctor Who. <laughs> That's that part, okay? So Andy's obsessed with good guys. He's a very, very good little actor like phenomenal he so 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 believable good guys is like a television show it's essentially muppet babies in this universe well at least i (laughs) thought it was muppet babies until later on in the film whenever he's in a closet and i can clearly see like there's a box behind him that's it says play set on it it doesn't say what brand or genre is but then i can see beaker and professor honeydew and i'm like (laughs) The Muppets, so the Muppets exist in this universe. I never noticed any of that stuff. What hell? I, I had Muppet babies on the brain while we were watching this. Okay, so they have a very sweet dynamic between them, and it opens up. It's Andy's birthday, and he wants a good guy doll because why not? It talks, and children aren't afraid of that for some reason. Which, pause, funny story about this being my favorite movie. When I was a child, like a young child, I was younger than seven. I don't know how much younger, but one of my mom's boyfriends was watching this movie and he called me and my sister out to the living room and it was right at a scene where he like popped out and I swear to God, I was so traumatized. We had to sleep with our closet light on just in case our dolls came alive and we could fist fight them. (laughs) Traumatizing. (laughs) <laughs> like I will kill you, you little plastic bitch. <laughs> and you have to imagine, or you have to think about how much this film was inspired by uh, the story of like Robert the Doll, or um... yeah. Oh, we don't say his name. Oh, sorry, sorry. Um, Bob. There we go. <laughs> and uh, Annabelle, because I know this. Th- I know this film started or this film series started out as it was supposed to be like a comment about capitalism before it became horror but like it's that uncanny valley with them as well the fact that they look just enough like us but nowhere near i know i i mean that's that's why like this is one of my favorite subgenres because they're so like unassuming you know like it's just a kid's toy but then there's always this like little background fear that i feel like a lot of people have of dolls and like like porcelain mm-hmm. dolls and like clowns and stuff i think it's the kind of thing and before there's the transformation where he gets the the eyebrows uh <laughs> later in the film he looks so much like an american girl's doll but like mm-hmm like a little like handyman sort of thing oh god yeah his i don't know like i so, i don't have a child brain but i can't imagine wanting one so you know he wants a good guy doll but like speaking of her job she she tells him that she didn't know he wanted one with enough time to save up um so he just got like a, a good guy tool set and like some clothes and things like that that is such like don't get me wrong like clothes i used to get clothes as a kid for like christmas christmas and, and birthdays like yeah like you you get given clothes that's fine such she was such a cock tease with that big box literally you know what he wants and it's just a pair of jeans in there it was trifling like <laughs> what did you need that big of a box for karen that was her karen moment okay <laughs> So she has to go to work, and um, she's got this crazy friend who I love, um, Maggie. And Maggie finds a peddler in the fucking alley who's selling one of these dolls for $50. So, of course, she gets it. $50 down from 100 that they then get down to 30 Yeah. And apparently that's just too much money. But this is a doll that talks. This is a talking doll, an intuitively talking doll. Hot. At, this, at the same time, this was thirty dollars for a doll in the nineteen eighties. Yeah, like that's at least if we're going by Lego prices, that's at least like <laughs> one hundred twenty dollars today. Yeah, but he's your friend till the end, Heidi. Ho, motherfucker! Oh, sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry. Did you 
Did you go a little bit John McLean there? A little bit. Sorry. <laughs> so yeah. So she gets him this doll, and I think one of the funniest lines in the, in this movie is when she takes him home, and she's like, "This isn't groceries. Of course, it's not fucking groceries, Karen. It's a big old long box covered in paper bags." Also, this all happens in the space of like three days. This yeah, film. I know. That is wild to me. I thought they would have built it up a little. No, I, no, I, I love it. I, I no. always thought the temporal framework was a lot different. Like I thought that they had like Chucky for at least a couple of weeks before this happened. No, no, because you know why? I, I like that it's so fast paced and that it just immediately like go. And then it like stays crazy from the minute that it's go. Um, if lost also, my train of thought. It also <laughs> kind of answers the question of why didn't uh, Chucky just escape from the peddler rather than wait till he was locked in with this little boy? There was no time. There was no time at all. Um, so Karen's bitch boss makes her uh, come back to cover somebody, which that's illegal. You can't force somebody to do that. Like that's past their shift. Fuck you. It's my kid's birthday. We're going to go home and play with this doll. It was the 80s. I don't give a rat tooth. That guy was a dickhead. Yeah, we're we're using that. We're using the line of it was a certain decade. Yeah, yeah, that's fine. But still, mm. the way <laughs> just the way I would have just walked out that bitch. Sorry, sir, I don't have a babysitter. Goodbye. Um, but Maggie offers to babysit, and Chucky. Okay, so Chucky is active that night. What I I another thing that I love about this movie is how you don't. E Chucky full on like moving and shit until a certain point in the movie so it's all like little little footsteps I love the POV from from his perspective when he's like peeking around corners and shit or like his little hand like reaching for shit I oh I love that that does the it does the like thing from the Adams family it does the little fingers oh yes <laughs> So, Maggie's not dealing with the shit. She thinks that Andy's playing games with her, and she keeps sending him to bed, and like, oh, it's not funny to put Chucky in front of the TV, and whatever, but like, I, w I, like, no, I'm not doing that. There's a point in time where he, like, gets a chair, Chucky gets a chair, and he's, like, trying to get up so he can get out of the house. I would have let him. I would have let his little ass go out. Which, I have an issue with that, because he does that then, but then whenever he's biting Karen later in the film and he runs out the door. Yeah. He doesn't need the chair. He just the door's slung open and he just runs out. Maybe it was unlocked. It was unlocked before as well though. Like it's only after he moves the chair that Maggie goes and locks it. Oh oh well. <laughs> That is valid. That is a valid point, but they forgot about that part when they were okay. filming the end. I'm not about to investigate a spooky noise, especially it's not in my house. I'm already fucking scared. Ghosts? Oh, want oh, ghosts? Oh. Do it. May I talk about the, the thing that I was going to tell you earlier? Maybe. I don't remember what it is. Okay, so I have an issue with horror films using this kind of uh, trope only because... <laughs> it's used so badly is that, is that someone will be watching something in a horror film and that background that background dialogue will in some way portray what's going to happen in that moment so whenever she gets up to close the window at the start whenever she first hears that little ta -da 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 of chucky running uh you hear on the television he goes uh Yes, it was a terrible accident. And Jay. You hear the lightning strike on the television whenever she first gets up and goes around. And I'm like, okay, so you're subverting pathetic fallacy to be inside the medium that you're writing in. That's, that's very interesting. But at the same time, I do have a love-hate relationship with it because it does, it's, it's, done very well for a certain amount of things but it's done very poorly for a lot of things okay i just think it's interesting because as many times as i've watched this movie i never noticed that the it's things the, that you pick up because it was um, the only dialogue 
it was the only dialogue in the in that scene because they were trying to ramp up tension by having Maggie be completely silent, uh, having no other noises but the building instrumental. So it was the only dialogue in that scene is someone on the television saying, "Yes, that." The, the accident was terrible, and then it sort of peters out, so you can kind of hear that it's supposed to be speech, but it's not. I have ADHD, so <laughs> I don't catch anything. I don't catch everything. Like, my brain will hyperfixate on other other parts of the movie. So, like, this is nice, because I never would have known that. I mean, she, she fucks up. She does go check, and um, she gets a tiny ha- hammer to the face, and she I falls out. Lost the hammer, and somehow makes, like, a visible dent in her forehead and the fact that that's a kid's toy that's fucking dangerous forget the fact that they're out here passing out dolls with serial killers in them hammers it was the 80s jay get out (laughs) just write it on your forehead i won't forget no at this time they were still putting putting lead paint in fucking toys unfucking believable so imagine Karen coming home from a shift she didn't want to work in the first place, missing her baby's birthday. And she comes home and her best friend is murdered. Her kid is, you know, should be traumatized. And, you know, Detective Norris is like, look, there's little footprints in in the flower. And Karen freaks out. But I mean, honestly, in all honesty, I would be like, oh, that's very weird <laughs> that there are little footsteps in flower mm-hmm. on my counter. And, and the fact that he says he checked every shoe in the guy's closet, but didn't check the slippers that he was wearing. Seriously, my guy? Who trained you, Norris? So Karen is, you know, she's um, she's grieving. She's hyper-aggressive with Norris and, like, kicks all the fucking cops out um, because they're grilling Andy, and he's a just-turned six-year-old. Um, and she just can't fucking take it. And he's like, I know who was on the counter. <laughs> That's what the madness begins. If your kid tells you that the doll they just got, the one that talks, is walking around and talking to him and shit, I would it throw it away. That's the $30 that I spent on it. We're not doing that. Someone just got murdered. I'm not playing any motherfucking games here. Uh, the fact that she lets him bring it to bed with him afterwards... No, it's going straight in the fucking trash. After, after you've heard him whispering to this doll, and you've heard him say, oh, the doll told me that she was a bitch and she got what she deserved, you get rid of that doll. I do not care. Like, you just throw it out the window or something. Seriously, because literally, literally, she not to be disrespectful, but she's asking for it at this point. The next day, she takes him to school. I'm just saying, like, you don't ask any... I, I get, like, suspend your disbelief for a second. There's a murder here. You know what I mean? Another little goof I noticed that um, Amazon did not tell me about whenever I was watching this film is that the windows broke. It's the yeah. middle of winter. Yeah. Their apartment's going to be freezing. They should have yes. a fire going 24-7. Or there they should do. be at least wind in the background. No, no, no. Oh. She lets it later, you remember? Yeah, she you're right. Matches. Like also, again, her apartment. Amazing for a single mom. Karen can't afford it. So, speaking of the quickness of this movie, literally the next day she takes Andy to school and Chuck says, no, we're not going to elementary school. We're going to find Eddie Caputo and I'm going to light his ass up. <laughs> Literally. Um, so, tiny Andy Barkley with his big fucking doll that's the same size as him like on a city bus. Just just go into a, a fucking on a train. On a train. And just with his little pom pom on his hat just bobbing around like going to Eddie how Caputo's you, house. Uh, how'd you get on the train? I get money. I don't know. It just boggles me. I know that Chucky I, didn't die with money and well, like he died and slipped some money into his Chucky overalls. And so that's for you, buddy. You need at it. Same, at the same time, like who let a six-year-old buy a train ticket for himself? That should not... Well, it was the 80s. <laughs> well, I want to say that, but, like, even then, like... I feel like that's not right. Someone's going to come over and say, where's your mommy? Have you lost your mommy? Because he's... And I, I don't mean this in a bad way, but it was the 80s. 
and he is a little white child. Yeah, they are. Con- they should be concerned. And he he is six, but he's so tiny. Like he's very very small for a six year old. Like his little snowsuit swallowed him alive. Him and Donnie Torrance have the same haircut. It they do. It suits him better. Yeah. Well. Stop shitting on Danny Torrance. He didn't do anything to you. So anyway, they get to Eddie Caputo's house. And Andy's like, hold on, I gotta take a tinky. And Chucky's like, fuck that. And he goes inside and he turns on the gas and spooks Eddie Caputo into literally exploding himself. I love that long tracking shot of like all the counter appliances. And it's just the same three rats running behind the whole thing. <laughs> that house looks like it should be like a terrace house. Like it had originally houses built on either side that have been knocked down. The 2005 Willy Wonka film. And uh, you, that no, movie doesn't exist. Okay, it doesn't exist. No, but do you remember at the end of it, they go to see Christopher Lee, who's a fucking dentist, and there's this terraced house just in the middle of nowhere. No, I don't remember because no, it doesn't no, exist. Because, yeah, okay, it doesn't exist. It also made me think of the Shrieking Shack, but we're not talking about Harry Potter anymore because fuck J.K. Rowling. That one exists. But yes, it was very much giving Shrieking Shack. That um, one exists, but it was discovered in like a chest in the desert and we don't know who the author was. So in this mixed scuffle, Obviously, the cops get involved because a fucking house exploded and uh, a, a criminal died. It was an accomplice to the notorious Lakeshore Strangler. So the cops get Andy and they call Karen down there. Andy's Karen does, full blown. Karen doesn't know it has anything to do with Andy because she hasn't picked him up from school yet. They go in and listen, he's talking about Chucky. He's telling them the truth and they don't believe him. Of course, they don't believe him. Like, it's a doll. They're grown ups. How how can you? This is this is the first movie I watched where I was like, I want to watch a, a movie about how they handle the situation afterwards. Like, and the rest of the cops show up and they have to explain that a doll tried to murder them all. The way I'm viewing it is like it was the eighties. There was plenty of crooked cops on the force, especially in Chicago. This is gonna slip away. Well, Karen does get you know, like, institutionalized or something. Like, that comes up in, in Child's Play 3, or 2, because he has to be put into foster care. And then in Child's Play 3, he's in military school, uh, you know, because his mom was crazy and believes in killer dolls, like a psychopath. So there's a, a doctor who is evaluating Andy, and he's like, Whoa. You need to let him come with us for a couple of days. And the place where they... And then, okay, so then Andy freaks out. And he's like, Chucky, did you hear that? You're going to take me away if you don't say something. Andy takes more initiative in those five minutes than fucking Danny Torrance takes in the whole fucking film. I knew you were going to bring up Danny Torrance. And the difference here is that... He has a little boy living inside of his mouth. It's different, okay? Plus, okay. his full grown ass daddy with an axe is coming after, and they're not the same. Right, no, but they had plenty to build off because in the book, as I've said before, Danny Torrance's uh, Tony that lives in his mouth is his 11 year old self from the future sending messages back to Danny. Okay, it doesn't really give that vibe in the movie. No, but that's fucking Kubrick. It's literally giving Pascal from Pet Cemetery. Okay, so obviously Chucky doesn't say anything, and I almost called him Danny. Fuck you, Day. That's your fault. Andy <laughs> punches Chucky's guts, and he's like, "You're a stupid bitch, Mom. He's lying. He said if I told anything, anybody, anything, that he was gonna kill me, and like that was enough." The doctor was like, "All right, scooping him up. He, he gotta come with me. Like he gotta go." And the place that they take him to is so sad, and like, like for cr- grown criminals, not babies. It's the middle of winter, and for some reason, his fucking barred window. The window is wide open in the middle of winter. But like, even in the middle of winter, who gives 
access, open access to children. It was the 80s. Like any time. Forget winter. Like summertime still. Somebody could just what? Squeeze through the bars, snap up a kid. Just they're just passing out kids. So all right, I mean, so there's the, another There is the what? wee girl later on who's just like sitting in line in the corridor or at, like in a corner. And even she knows Chucky's fucking been there. And these oblivious adults, like but that's probably just as much attention as they, they pay these kids to be honest. There is this awesome scene also where Andy is like looking out the bars and you see Chucky climbing the stairs and he's like, Oh, Chucky's coming. <laughs> and the doctor immediately is like, I don't see anything. And I stood up and yelled, You're not even fucking, bro. <laughs> I want to know who was in like the full on Chucky costume. Like, yeah. I'm sure they've hired like a, like a, yes. like a small person or. A child to do those long shots, but I want to know who was in. We should have googled it. We should have looked it up. You know what? I'll do it now. Well, before that, Andy gets out of his room because um, the doctor wants to sedate him. Oh wait, no. no. Chucky comes into the room and thinks he's he's got one over on him, but Andy's a really smart little boy. Um, Karen has prepared him well for life of serial killer dolls. I mean, it serves him well throughout the entire franchise. He tries to escape. He's like, fuck you. And then the doctor tries to sedate him. But I'm like, the doctor was alone with Andy, a tiny, tiny six-year-old boy. And he's like, I gotta overpower you. I'm struggling. Like, that's why you got fucking scalpeled. I did just find something out. Apparently, Chucky's full name, Charles Lee Ray. Yeah. He's derived from Charles Manson. Lee Harvey Oswald and James Earl Ray, who was the assassin of JFK and Martin Luther King Jr. Yeah, that fucks me up, dude. I wish I didn't know that. <laughs> I really wish I could have gone the rest of my life not knowing that. Of all the dudes to pick? Well, assholes. Yeah, Charlie Manson. Serial killer. Yes, and, I know. Deranged assassins. The um, fuck? Okay, so uh, Karen brings Chucky home. And then oh my god. Threatens him. Wait, please wait. <laughs> this is my all-time favorite scene in this movie. This scene makes the entire movie for me okay, because she freaked out a little bit. Okay, and she was like, talk to me. And then he's like, hi, I'm Chucky, I'm your friend. And she's like, oh. <laughs> and then she finds out there's no fucking batteries in his back. So she goes to open him up, and the way his head flips around, and she screams and drops him in that dramatic roll under the couch, and I'm like, ooh, ooh, it gets me every time. <laughs> so she <laughs> takes a little peek. <laughs> she, she drops him, and then he does a combat roll under the couch, and she's just like, <laughs> no, she was peeing. She was peeing her pants at that point. So then, she takes him out from underneath the couch, <clears throat> and she's like, "Talk to me." And she's she's getting aggressive. And he's not doing anything, and she says, "All right, I'll make you talk." And she says, "I I cannot control myself." Anytime I watch this part, it is so funny to me. I've posted it on social media so many times. She says. Talk to me, damn it, or I'm gonna throw you in the fire. And he immediately comes to life and is like, You stupid bitch! It's, <laughs> and his it's face so, crumples. It's, it's so funny because it's such a clear deviation from what his face was before. Like, he suddenly has a huge ass <laughs> eyebrow. Like, a whole different texture. He's like not shiny anymore. He's almost like, not like waxy, but like. No, he is waxy. Waxy and like felty. It's almost like a waxy felt that his skin is made the on. Eyes. The eyes are so different as well. At first, they're like big, bright, and blue, and then they narrow and get bloodshot. <laughs> oh my gosh! Like those, they have these like uh, stuffed animals or something that like do the thing, and then they have the scary face, and then they go back to normal. That was very popular for no reason. Like why? <laughs> why do people want that? People that's what he's like. Fucking agents. 
So anyway, Chucky escapes after biting Karen. He bites the fuck out of her. And my thing is, because it keeps happening. You always go to bite her neck. On the yeah. Neck. I don't know. He's a, he's a weirdo. He's so fucking weird. But like, literally at that point, I'm like, the way that I would have tackled that ginger bitch. Sorry, Jay. And like, pin him down to the ground. I had a whole plan. Put my knees on his arms because he's small. I don't, give a, I don't give a fuck. If he has the strength of a grown man, he's still small. And then I would have decapitated him with my bare hands. Okay? You're not. But, but Nope, I would have found a way. No, uh, as we realized from the end of this film, that won't stop him. I know. Through the heart. After that, Karen goes to talk to the detective. Oh, she's, she's very weird with him. Like, well, yeah, we have to go find out where the doll came from. And he's, like, not going to go with her because he thinks she's fucking crazy. Which he is a little, like, you know, crazy at that point. But, like, it, understandable. Dog's bitter in the throat. Um, <laughs> like, no, thank you. And he's telling her not to go because it's a bad part of town. And she goes, anyway of her talking to homeless people and never once being sexually assaulted and then the second she finds the person she needs he he basically said titties for info it's weird because he had a homeless lady like he was wrapped around a homeless lady when she found him so like I'm sure that lady would have you know before he was like, milady, mm, shall we go peruse the canals? And then he was like, nah, let's fucking get something out of this gear. Yeah, psychotic. He should have just taken the money and like told her where it came from. But Norris to the rescue. No worries, no worries. He shows up and roughs the guy up and he's like, you're going to tell me. And he does. And surprise, he's like, toy store. Wabash and Van Buren. How was how was that doll not in police custody? Even even if even if the toy store had burned down and it was smoke damaged, it's still evidence. If it was found right beside your man's body. Yes, but it was the eighties. Okay, that's our answer. <laughs> <basically>. <laughs> valid question, valid question, but we'll add that to the list of uh, inconsistencies. So then he's like that's where I killed Charles Lee Ray. And she does this weird thing where she's like, why didn't you ever tell me? Like, they're fucking friends. You just met this guy. I know they're trying to build them up to be like, you know. Oh, Softies for each other. He can be your new dad, Andy. But no. That didn't work out. All right. So, all that. And, uh, I mean, we didn't talk about... Oh, no, wait. No, that's coming up now. So... The car. She's trying to, ex yes. <laughs> She's trying to explain to him like you're in danger because if he went after Eddie Caputo, he's gonna go after you. And that guy's like, oh, "Fuck you, good night." But like, the math is mathing, sir. Wh why are you not concerned? Because you know that's an awfully strange coincidence that you're just gonna ignore because I couldn't, regardless. Yeah, again, like, it, it, yeah, I know we're gonna get to the car thing in a second but it's it's, it's right now we can talk about it <laughs> it's the scene after that that i have issue with okay you're talking about after the car yeah i'm talking about in, in chucky's apartment okay well I, I i have an issue in chucky's apartment too so just really quickly chucky ends up in norris's car and he's like trying to stab him in the booty hole from under the sink he strangled him <laughs> Um, did he cut the guy's brakes? No, he pushed. Okay, so then I'm the held. So I'm just, separate. I'm just not understanding because I feel like there were, even though he was being attemptedly stabbed in the booty hole, there were several opportunities for him to hit the brakes. I just feel like use your long legs, daddy long legs. It, it felt very like Spielberg or Who Framed Roger Rabbit whenever he leapt up from the seat. Yeah. But somehow has his foot in the accelerator. Yeah, well, Chucky doesn't get him and goes away. Uh, After being and... shot. Huh? After being shot. After being shot. Oh, yeah. So, yeah, Chucky discovered that it hurt. Yeah, hold on. 
he came away with nothing but a scratch in his hand. Like, he came away from that car flipping on its hood and skidding across with nothing but, like, a cut in his hand. And he never brings up that with Karen. He never brings that up with Karen. No. Like, the car crash. No, because he's, he's very young. And then and he's a cop. And he's the 80s. <laughs> in Chicago. No, no, I'm not sure. All right, so Karen went to go to Chucky's apartment, and and Norris is all creepy in the in the darkness. He meets her there. Surprise! Here's my issue: there are paintings all over the walls, the murals all over the walls, and there are like a nude Charles Lee Ray in these graphic rituals and i must say i don't know if he painted them himself but he was very generous with the size of his peen in that painting okay that's your issue with that i have a, I yes have that's issue my issue <laughs> i have an issue with the paintings as well but it's not the size of his penis it's uh, <laughs> the fact that he openly admits he didn't know if it would work and he didn't know if he believed in it until he did it he obviously believed it why is he painting a mural about the guy? Why is he painting a mural about John? Why is he painting all this stuff being like praising the gods if he doesn't know that it's going to work? I think that he he meant specifically because it was a doll that he didn't know that it would work. Right, but he, he doesn't strike me as like a very reverent sort of person. Like, even though it's not necessarily a Judeo-Christian God. Um, it strikes me really weird that he is still like talking about it so afterwards, talking about it so openly and so derogatorily if he's depending on it. You know what mm -hmm. I mean? Yeah, but my thing with him is that he has an ego bigger than these deities and he, he speaks about them in this way as they're like tools to him, a means to something that he wants. I don't think that he respects them at all, only for what they can do for him. Right. So, like, he doesn't respect them at all. He just uses them. Yeah. And this is probably me nitpicking because we've seen so many films where, like, these gods or the higher figures have taken their revenge on people who have used, like, Pinhead. Pinhead's lot. Like, okay. Cenobites. Cenobites, yes. So they're taking people who would abuse their power and making them suffer instead. I don't understand how Chucky gets away with it, though. Like how he gets away without, without like, divine retribution? Yeah, especially considering that he straight up murders the doctor. Doctor Death. D doctor, well, Doctor John. He's Dr. Death. Oh, Dr. If Death. you pause it right in that moment, you'll meet Dr. Death. Okay, so like he he kills Dr. John, or Dr. Death with his own shit. Like, I'm sorry, if you are so high up in that religious circle, you are not going to look at a toy and be fooled by a voodoo doll. You are going to use some like counter something it's or, not or, magic the gathering you know no, what i, I mean? mean like it's, it's not, not like a wizard battle but i'm thinking of like anthony hopkins in uh that one film that we watched uh what the right the right yeah it's like, not what, it's not like he, that um i know but he shows such fear in the face of chucky and it's like he is tiny because he's at the door that's no, that's how I feel. But the reason why he's looking at Chucky like that, you know how he says that like you're an abomination? It's because he's so offended by the affront he's putting on, like that is not what we do. That's not what any of this is for. And he's literally like horrified. And the massive like repercussions of something like that. And he's also probably taking accountability and like I'm the one who showed Chucky how to do this. Like this is my fucking fault and having to deal with that. But not it's all like, deities take action in that way at all, especially on this side of the spectrum. 
And also, if you really think about it, Shucky does get divine retribution. Look at his entire existence as a doll. He does. It's just the naivety of Doctor Death that throws me off. Like the fun he's just a human. He's just a human. You know, humans only have the one lifetime to learn everything about what they want to learn. And you don't. We don't really know. You no, know. It's just I. I am not sure in the 1980s. Uh, practicer of that faith mm -hmm. uh, in Chicago in a very racist area would let a white man, yes, but like a white man such as Chucky. Mm -hmm. That's cool. Yes, especially because, like, I mean, he had to have seen the murals and shit on his wall. In real life, this would not have been a thing because it's a closed practice. I don't want to be derogatory. But the guy on Spooky Island in the first Scooby-Doo movie had more sense. The guy that was sacrificing an already dead chicken had more sense than Dr. Death does. <laughs> I'm over you. <laughs> so, yes. Grave mistake. One that not everybody would make. But he made it and he suffered for that because Chucky said, you're going to show me how to get out of this body because I got shot and it hurt. And I bled. And he's like, yeah, you're turning human. And he's, fuck that. I don't want to be human in a little in a little body. Because then people can, like, fuck him up. And progressively throughout the rest of the film, he does begin to uh, look more like the, the human Chucky. Like, he starts to get a unibrow. Yeah, it's gross. Lose his hairline. Like, it starts to go further back and back. It's interesting. At one point, actually, they did plan to... Um, have Chucky grow like stubble to make him look more human. I <laughs> digress. After this point, he goes after Andy. I think it's stupid, respectfully, <laughs> Dr. Death. I think it's stupid that to get out of that body, he has to transfer a soul into the first person that he revealed. That's fucking stupid. And of course. Because, because he says that he's an abomination being inside that body. Okay. <laughs> so. Jump into anybody. It's been done before. So he's not an abomination. There's a track record of this. No, he is an abomination. Yes, he's an abomination, but him saying you're an abomination and then saying, oh, I know offhand how this happened, how you fix it, clearly says to me, <laughs> this guy is like, I... <laughs> it's happened before. Or at least it's a common enough occurrence that he knows the immediate fix to it. I was literally like, <laughs> how the fuck does he know? <laughs> and also, I would have lied. Because obviously he's going to kill you anyway. I would have just lied. And then boom, he's dead. Like, with your last act. I would just assume he's going to kill me anyway. You know what I mean? How can you trust a serial killer doll? I love, I love that whenever you twist the leg <laughs> and you see, you see the, the actual appendage, like, twist in a different way. It was... yeah. So much like, like Stranger Things season four. We don't talk about Stranger Things in this podcast. <laughs> Purely because I I don't like Stranger Things because it gives off too much of a Steven Spielberg in the 80s vibe, like E.T. and Jurassic Park. I like. love that. That's what the people like. You like it. I don't. It feels so cheesy to me, and I'm not in the mood for it. You're missing out, but we're, we're digressing. We're digressing. Yeah, we um, are. This is for you and Parker's Stranger Things podcast. I can't wait. I can't wait. So, anyways, he goes after Andy. He does. Andy escapes the asylum after literally after your mom's been shocked to death with the electro shock stuff. But like his face blacks up so quickly, and I'm not sure that's how that works. And I'm the blood sure just that <laughs> the blood the blood I can buy. The blackening of yeah, the Yeah, but with skin. the black face? This isn't a fucking oven. I don't, I don't know what it's like to get electroshocked to death. I don't know. Loved him getting electroshocked to death, though. Yes, he gets out, and Nurse asks Karen... Where would he go? Yes, he's a smart little boy. I don't know how the fuck he knew where he was in, in, in relation to the <laughs> asylum. American cities are all, being, are all made around the same sort of grid. <laughs> like they're all straight lines there's no like oh you need to go down this one wee alleyway and then you turn left if you turn right uh 
if you see the chicken, you've gone too far. You know, that's that's not what American cities are like. Not the chicken. I don't know. I had a horrible sense of direction until I was an adult and had to drive myself places. So I would not. As a six-year-old, no way. But he's smart. So he gets in there. He's got his little bat. Chucky comes down the freaking chimney. And <laughs> I love I love that scene where he comes on the chimney yes. and like, the second he hits the ground the knees bend and he like bounces up like I want to know who was in that suit. That did Hell yeah! And then he kicks the little thing down. Okay. A- <laughs> I literally there's another scene that makes me laugh so hard. You know he's trying to get Andy. Andy's trying to outsmart him, um, but when he hits him with the bat he drops it. So he's left defenseless and he's like backing up. And Chucky yells, a oh, surprise! <laughs> uh, surprise. Yeah, he really fucked up a lot of his kills by saying, by screaming or like shouting surprise something before he killed them. Literally. Like, and I'm like, dude. If James, Bond, if James Bond taught us nothing, it's you said the clever quip after you've killed the person. I don't think that Academia was Charles, uh, you know, like, strong suit. So, you call him fucking James Bond Academia. I don't think he's smart. Okay, that's just the that's just the thing, and that's why he yelled, "Oh, surprise!" <laughs> and it was bad. It just kind of ends because Narcs and Karen get home, and then they're screaming all over the apartment. They know Karen knows they have to get him in the heart, and they're still doing everything except shooting him in the heart. She has terrible aim. I know that Norris got cut, but like, use the gun. Best handy line in the whole film. Yeah. But Andy, I'm your friend to the end. He says, This is the end, friend. I'm like, Yeah. He says, This is the end. <laughs> and then his face like, got all like angry and he goes, Friend. Yeah, so, but then his like little pieces, they kind of stay animated. Like, you have to really kill Chucky, and you don't really kill Chucky. And I don't understand how that works at all. Because they definitely got him in the heart. There was like blood on the walls. And then um, Mike's friend, his cop friend. Um, Jack. Jack, yeah. I love that you know his name because I don't. Um, I, and they don't touch name. anything. I only know his name because I looked it up to find out because I was oh. like, this guy is my favorite character. He is the funniest motherfucker because he's like, the the, mo- the majority of the time, he's the only one making sense. He's like, the doll. The doll yeah, the doll. like we oh, get it. What are, you, but... what are you talking about? You know, he's, he's like the most rational one of them all. It's not that they're irrational, though. <laughs> the doll really is alive trying to kill him. I, I know that, but like, if we didn't know that Chucky was actually alive, who would you trust more, Jack or Karen or? You're and asking even me. After he, even no, no. Even after he gets choked out by Chucky's corpse and he throws him in the corner and he dies, and uh, Mike turns to him and it was like, "Do you believe me now?" And Jack's like, "Yeah." Like, what the fuck do you take me for? Like, I trust what my eyes see. He said, but who's going to believe me? And that's where I'm like, you're right. I want to see what you told your pop friends. I want to know how you spun this. Oh, you know? like, I want to know what you did with the, the charred doll pieces. And like, did you test the blood on the walls for Charles E. Ray's blood? You know, like, his DNA is on file. I did. Well, it was the 80s. <laughs> <laughs> and considering that the toy shop burned down, I imagine... Charles but I mean, read CM Fiat twice. Okay. But it, that's, that's pretty much the whole film. But I wanted to ask you one question. Mm-hmm. What was your favorite at either kill or attempted murder in this film? Like, what, what plan of Chucky's was your favorite to kill someone? Honestly, with all due respect to Chucky, I feel like all of his kids were pretty weak in this movie i think my some of my favorites are in other movies like i I get that but i mean like in this film it was like some of them are comedic some of them aren't some of them are clever some of them aren't what is your like what would you say out of this film's kills 
or almost kills is your favorite? Uh, I'm gonna have to go with I know I know it's not technically an attempt to kill because he left, but like uh, when he attacked the fuck out of Karen. Bitter. Yeah. Yes, because he bit her so deep, and then she went to show Norris like, look, and he's like, oh my god, what happened? And she's like, Chucky bit me, and he's like, fuck off, lady. Because. <laughs> Because mine is whenever he tried to stab Mike in the balls <laughs> through the car seat. <laughs> well, you almost ruined him. Yeah, you don't just tap attempt- a man in the balls. That's an attempted murder, and it's so funny because it's built up to be like this genuinely scary, but it's so funny out of context. It's like he's like, "Whoa!" And leaps <laughs> out of the seat. It's very goofy. Um. <gasps> Yes. Another another shining thing is that uh, <laughs> there's a reference in this film to the shining is whenever Chucky's stabbing through the bathroom door. Um Oh yeah. Yeah, trying oh, to stab he, Karen in the face. You know that he does that he does that in another Chucky movie. It it's either C- it's either Chucky or Chucky. I think it's Cedar of Chucky. Because he's chopping down the door and he sticks his face in and he looks around and he's like, you know, I can't think of a thing to say. Love it, love it. See, this was back whenever they were trying to start a franchise, and then they got ridiculous with it later. That's, yes, that's, 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 fun. that's when it became my. F- that's honestly when it just became like my favorite thing ever because I'm like, it's so fucking funny. It's a it's party so of itself. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, it really is, and it just gets more and more ridiculous. But then when they get to like. Uh, curse and cult, it starts to like try to turn it back around to be serious and I'm like, don't do that. Don't do me like that. I stuck with you this whole time. Curse was kind of cool. Keep it, keep it campy. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, but then he was like real serious and that's when you remember that he's like a fucking criminal and like a murderer and stalker. So that was Child's Play. Next week is Constantine. Can't wait. I love Keanu. Uh, Keanu X Demons. It's all good. Um, so you can find this podcast on the internet at ghostmagazine.site. You can follow the magazine on Twitter at, um, whoa. GITM podcast. GITM podcast. And you can follow me on Twitter at witchxpudding. You can follow me at atlas underscore snow. (laughs) Okay, bye.